Hey guys, what's going on? I got five books to talk to you about today, so let's get into it. First one is The Sands of Mars by Arthur C. Clarke. Totally random book I picked up off my shelf. Haven't heard of it before. Very obscure, and for good reason, I will say. I'm honestly surprised how much I remember about this book. I read it a while ago at this point. I went to a wedding and got COVID. Seems like a very common one-two punch nowadays. So it's been a while, and there wasn't an exciting hook. There weren't any interesting details that I can say here that will entice anybody. It was about a science fiction author who takes one of the first non-essential space flights to Mars. And the biggest problem with this book was that there was no problem. There was no conflict for the first half of the book and it just relied upon you being excited about these very, very mundane details about spaceflight. And it made me very aware of how jaded I've become about science fiction in general, about space travel in general. But at the same time, the book somehow made me reorient myself and realize that the universe is really massive and to a certain extent unimaginable, and it certainly hasn't been entirely mapped out. I was kind of able to leech Arthur C. Clarke's perspective in this book and what I imagine the general perspective was on space travel in the 50s, 60s, whenever it was. So I'll, I'll give it that. And I will also say it had a really cool idea for the spacecraft, definitely a retrofuturism thing. It was this big, bulbous, uh, what do you call it, a dumbbell. And it had the radioactive core in one section and then this long, thin corridor over to the sleeping quarters because they didn't want the astronauts exposed to the radiation, which which made sense and it made for a good visual, I think. But if you weren't interested in the details of the story, then you weren't interested in any aspect of the story because that's all there was. Eventually he does get to Mars and there's this moon is a harsh mistress kind of communal social aspect to the story, which is kind of interesting. And then eventually there is something that happens. <laughs> but that's about all I can say. It seemed like he was under a deadline. He knew that he needed to get someone a novel, and this was the idea that kept getting pushed back because it wasn't very original. It was a science fiction author, him, just imagining what it would be like to go to Mars, just as a human being in a real non-fantastical sense. Not his best. I was actually about to dismiss Arthur C. Clarke because I was thinking about Rendezvous with Rama, which had a similar kind of plot structure where there was a lot of nothingness for a while and then something really interesting. Still maybe not worth the buildup, but then I remember he also wrote Childhood's End. So uh, Arthur C. Clarke, definitely still worth reading. This was a low spot, but I'll revisit him again. Next, I read The Weapon Shops of Isher by A.E. Van Vogt. I remember reading this short story a long time ago and it being confusing but interesting. And I gotta say, he continues that trend in the, the novel version. The Weapon Shop is an organization that will supply anyone with a gun. A very special kind of gun that only acts in self-defense, specifically trying to combat this totalitarian government led by the Princess of Isher. What is it? The, the Empress of Isher, right. So the book begins by developing this concept and then switches off to this character-driven storyline about a kid going from the suburbs into the big city and making some unfortunate real-world discoveries and didn't have much to do with the first part. And then I thought I was understanding where the book was going. This interesting concept about something or someone trying to be karma police, trying to create this department or this organization that tries to balance out the world, that tries to make bad things happen to bad people and good things happen to good people, which might be a good application of AI if they can be the, uh, the justice bringers of the world, if you can try to figure out how to program justice, but that's neither here nor there. Ultimately, this book jumped around a lot. I thought I knew where it was going and then it jumped to a totally different thread and then I thought I knew where it was going and it jumped again. And then I had no idea what was going on and I'm not above admitting that. I was totally lost by the end of this book. And I looked it up. I don't normally look a book up as soon as I'm done, but I did with this one. 
and I realized it was a fix-up novel. And actually, A.E. Van Vogt, apparently the originator of the fix-up novel, I read that in a random review on Goodreads, so uh, maybe true, maybe not. And that makes total sense, because it read as three or four different short stories kind of just smashed into each other and made into a book. Sometimes fix-up novels are great, but other times they are like this, and they aren't woven correctly, so they just read as, as these disjointed stories. But what, when you can have that perfect integration where, where they creep into each other and they add to each other, it really works. This one didn't. I have a feeling that the short story did well, so A.E. Van Vogt was like, okay, how do I turn this into a story? How do I turn this into a full-length novel? and it didn't really work out. Some cool concepts in here, like I said, that made me think that it was going certain ways that it didn't, but those ways that it could have gone could have been interesting. Uh, but ultimately, kind of a slog, and it sucks when, you, when you've lost the thread of a story, but you're still reading it, and you're just trying to grasp onto anything that makes sense to try and claw your way back into understanding Makes you feel dumb, but if you read that one and you didn't quite understand it, you're in good company. So after that one, I was desperate for something good. I went to my shelf and I said, okay, what is the book I've been looking forward to most? And that was a recent acquisition of The Day of the Triffids by John Wyndham. And thank God this book was awesome. It's a post-apocalyptic world and I haven't looked this up. I didn't look this one up on Goodreads because I, I enjoyed it and I liked formulating my own thoughts and opinions on it, but maybe the first, one of the first zombie stories. Not your traditional zombie story, but definitely the origin for that kind of genre. This one also has a good hook. So our main character has suffered a head injury and is in the hospital with their head wrapped up like a mummy like they did back in the old days. And there's some sort of astronomical event, like the eclipse that we had recently, that everyone goes outside to look at. But guess what? If you looked at it, you went blind, 100%. So our character finds himself one of the few sighted in a world that has gone blind. So he becomes very valuable, but also very vulnerable because everyone is looking for someone who can see. Our main character can. It's set in England, so he goes to London and sees all of the turmoil, people just kind of punching through store windows and desperately trying to get a, a fruit or anything. Meanwhile, there is this semi-sentient plant creature called the Triffid, who also can't see, but is more adapted to a sightless life and thrives in this new environment because it's kind of like a Venus flytrap where it it rips off human flesh and dissolves it in some sort of fluid and digests it. And in this book, the Triffids are the zombies. Everyone tries to make these new civilizations, these new uh, societies, much like The Walking Dead, much like most zombie movies and shows that you've seen. They cluster in groups and they build fences and they war with neighboring societies and they all fight the zombies or the Triffids which are attracted to sound and maybe to light, I forget. And there's even that cliche zombie scene where the Triffids have so much weight against a fence that with their sheer mass and their sheer numbers, they topple it over. And that's when I thought to myself, okay, this has to be the first zombie story. It was just really entertaining. It was really well done. I could actually relate to the characters. There was no glaring societal challenges to overcome, if you know what I mean. And I just love that story. I love the zombie story where it brings into question your morality and how much do you sacrifice your own well-being for the well-being of everyone else around you? What is the value of maintaining your humanity in a world that is rapidly shedding their own humanity? Very much like uh, Octavia Butler Parable of the Sower kind of thing. I think that was a much more deep dive into that idea, whereas this was just a more surface level entertainment style zombie post-apocalyptic book. It was first person, it was fast paced. It was exactly what I was looking for after those two boring, aimless science fiction books. So I will be reading more of John Wyndham. I liked his style. It was very readable, like I said, very fast paced, but it still made you stop at a few points and appreciate a sentence 
or expand your vocabulary in a few ways. And not just because he was British and he uses a lot of weird British words. After that, I read Some of Your Blood by Theodore Sturgeon. I have been wanting to read more of this guy for a while. Found this book recently, figured I'd give it a shot. First thing I'll say is this book is not science fiction, technically. You could have probably looked at the cover and told me, well, obviously it doesn't look like science fiction, it looks more like a horror story, and you'd be right. But three instances of the phrase science fiction appear on the front and back of this book. You got one right there. You got one on the spine there. You'll have to take my word for it. And it also says science fiction in the blurb on the back here. But it was still a good story, probably novella length, but there's a lot of meat on the bone there. I will compare it to In Cold Blood by Truman Capote. They try and accomplish the same thing, but in opposite ways. In Cold Blood, he introduces you to a monster and then humanizes them. Some of your blood, both have blood in the title. Didn't realize that. Theodore Sturgeon introduces you to a human and then demonizes them, but they both try and impart compassion and understanding specifically in how they became the monster that you're seeing. It begins with like this Harlan Ellison bookend type thing where Theodore Sturgeon is like, hello dear reader, welcome to this magical world and take a look at the desk of this army psychologist and take a look at this folder brimming with papers. And I don't like that kind of thing. I don't know, it's a little too personal for me, but whatever. It is about a fictional psychological survey of someone in the army. One of their letters home gets flagged by a censor and a couple different people are looking at the case and trying to figure out what exactly is going on. You amongst them. And it is really interesting and it is really well developed. It has this kind of Stephen King vibe to it where you are constantly enticed by these, let's say, primal aspects to the story. And you relate to the guy. He, he is exactly like George from Of Mice and Men. So it's really easy to sympathize with the character. And then even as you learn what he actually is, you still do sympathize with him. I don't want to spoil too much about this book because I recommend that you read it. Not a lot of people have heard about it, probably, and it was a good read. Not science fiction, not too dark, although at the end there is this very strange turn that I wish I could talk about that I feel like was kind of unnecessary and almost like a, like a sick punchline. But anyways, I would describe it as the most factual account of a vampire that would be plausible in the real world. If that's not enticing enough, how about a man whose emotional and moral development ended as a fetus? Maybe that'll get you. But also had kind of a Fifth Business by Robertson Davies vibe. It's this huge chunk of introspection into this character. It's not introspection, it's extrospection? When it's other people looking at somebody? But you're, you're analyzing this character and you are really figuring out how they became a certain way. And it does all come back to one significant moment like it did in Fifth Business. And it makes you realize how crucial childhood is and how one wrong move can, uh, can really screw you for the rest of your life. And uh, this is as good of a segue as any into the last book I read, which was Real Food for pregnancy because my wife is pregnant. We are expecting a child in December and uh, we are thrilled and we are overwhelmed. And uh, I am one that wants to figure out the whole thing before you go forward with something. But as I've learned, this is not something you can do that with. I had never really read a book about diet. I hadn't thought about it a lot, but it is true that what you are ingesting is the fuel of your body that sounds very cliche, but you lose sight of that throughout the day when you're just grabbing something and putting it in your body and not really thinking about what is in that and not really thinking about how your body uses that. So it's, it's been good for my health and obviously my, my, my wife's health as well. I've been cooking the meals before I got COVID. Hopefully I'll be restarting that soon. Eggs is a huge thing. And also we were trying to eat vegetarian, but as she says in this book, there hasn't been a vegetarian diet found that gives you all the necessary nutrients while you're pregnant. Looks like meat's back on the menu, boys. And it also details the dangers of soy, which is 
mostly what's in all the meatless stuff these days. So very eye-opening in a lot of ways. We've been eating a lot of fish, we've been eating a lot of eggs, a lot of eggs. Apparently, in order to get enough selenium, I think it is, you need to eat like eight eggs a day. But I'm not eating eight eggs a day. Who's eating eight eggs a day? My wife certainly isn't. It's enough that I can get her to eat like two or three. But it's also made me think, and maybe this ties back into science fiction a little bit, that the finish line here on Earth, the goal that whatever aliens put us here, they expect us to create the perfectly nourished fetus and that will produce the next iteration of mankind and allow us to transcend into the universe at large. But that's a very difficult task, and you think that we could do it now because we have global shipping routes, but those aren't ideal, and we add certain things to the food that maybe detract from the nutritional value, so we're still working on that. I'm certainly not going to accomplish this feat, but maybe one day we will have the perfectly nourished fetus and, and that means getting foods from all over the world in, in all different seasons and environments and getting them to the single pregnant woman in one small part of the world, which is a, a huge feat and does make you proud of the human race and what we have managed to do. To get a pineapple to uh, the United States in wintertime, that is pretty amazing. Despite the preservatives and all the negative things that come with that. It is impressive. And you wonder throughout history how many malnourished fetuses have been out there because when you're eating in Ireland in the winter, not a lot of diversity there and uh, certainly not all of the nutrients and minerals she talks about in this book. I have been desperately trying to get my wife to eat liver. Apparently that is huge for iron and uh, it sucks. I don't like liver, and she doesn't like liver. I've tried to cook it with bacon, I've tried to cook it with all different things, but it still sucks. So, what's a good liver recipe? Do you got one? If you do, let me know in the comments. Otherwise, thanks for watching, subscribe if you haven't, and I will see you next time. Bye-bye.